come as a friendly interloper, a poet, an artist, the ones that Louise suggested should be employed instead of surveyors and planners, uh, a mystic among rationalists. In terms of images, uh, the best photos that I show will be by my good friend Alistair Peebles and by Hannah Devereaux. Uh, the ones with poems are my own. And I'll be reiterating some of the points that Neil made. To follow Louise's interrogation of the marginal, how related are the ideals of decentralized culture and decentralized energy? Barry Cunliffe argues that culture flowers where there is the greatest ratio coast to land. Island cultures are avant-garde, pioneers, whether in the evolution of species, linguistic dialects, or energy technologies. Every region proposes a different relationship between energy production, environment, and culture. The macrocosm of the ocean proposes the scientific method in wave devices. The microcosm of the island cautions that technological, that technological innovation is subject to local conditions, such as types of wave and mollusk. As we discussed yesterday, the coastal rural also has its shadow other, the sea, areas named for navigation, fishing, and now energy. I call the uh, space of the sea, off Bilia crew, the diamond space, and that's where the testing happens. Wind and wave energies return productive meaning to the sea, culturally, as well as in terms of generation. What new forms of culture will emerge in response to the era of renewables, which Neil has helpfully defined? Will the focus of land culture and the cult of petroleum be drawn to coasts, islands, and tides? Will culture and energy networks be decentralized as part of a parallel or an integrated process? Before wind and tide were harnessed for power generation, they were understood in their natural state, described in cultural forms such as place names, which embody concepts of nature, in particular an awareness of weather energies. Stromness, the tide head, and uh, these structures are nicknamed the pretzels. Coastal toponyms are expressions of weather and sea, projecting images of tide, wind, and navigation. Some names may be said to prophesy. They contain the speech energies of ancient language communities, elements of linguistic archaeology, particularly in Orkney, and are propelled by the linguistic force that we know as dialect. I know it comes out a bit of dialect when I say it, but just dialect. <laughs> dialect. Combining localised consciousness and metaphors that relate to place mythopoetically. Energy technology juxtaposes instrumental reason <coughs> against the irrational forces of nature in terms always of specific landscapes, most notably Costa Head <coughs> and Bilia Crew. Rural industrial test sites of worldwide significance. Culture, from the sacred coastal installations of the Neolithic to contemporary place aware artworks, is a means to comprehend and rebalance these tensions. How do cultural processes, such as naming and archaeology, relate to energy landscapes? in terms of generation, memorialising, and prophecy. Well, to begin with, in terms of linguistic archaeology, <coughs> rivers are evidence. They have the oldest names. Rivers are the glens, flowers, 
the Glen's floors. This is the Dee watershed, Geldy shine water, Humber shade water, River Dee water of the goddess. Uh, the oldest names of all air or to cause to move, which give the first name simply flowing of water. Place names are social signs for natural forms. Majin Monarch, the lassie on the hill, the flower of the mountain, the flower of the mountain. This is in the Cairngorms in Glenderry, a name that doesn't appear on any of the OS. At well springs and confluences, we find the worship of flowing water signified that the river is the goddess. If motion was mythopoetically the flow of time, we can now see it was also the flow of energy. Place names are sound designating realities. The strength of running water is known in its motion, vocalised in burn names, personified as out laurag, the speechifying burn, out lunak, the songful burn, cal, calater, caladere, out chala, crying, hard calling, spate water, fleet water, churning through a stone trough. Those are different interpretations of that ancient term, calater, which we can't fully penetrate. In the same way, the I burn an ancient name, I going, I moving, Erin, moving I, I driving I, I rapid I, I keening, I. Gairn from Goyern, wailing, gaining, crying, howling. Gurnuk, the wee crier, gurning, flowing, flowering water. Nicolaisen reminds us that place names are narratable, and so the archaeology of energized names prophesizes energy technologies. Corimalzi, the Mel Corrie, the name is a history of how the burn powered over generations. The turning of a Gallic meal mill, turning into the Victorian Hydro Lighting Mar Lodge, turning into today's Braemar Community Hydro. The energy potential is historically ancient, even if its fulfillment is current. Eras of energy come and go, like the click mills or turlows of Smugro, generating enough flow for a light at night and to tune the radio. Neil showed some of these old photos, and these collages were made by Alistair and myself, which means mainly Alistair. <laughs> a turlow at the door, a rowing by the old croft. They show the gust motion an invisible influence that would pass unknown but for the shush of strewn leaves or the turbines wavering hard. <coughs> Technology is an expression of natural forces. Design is modified by metaphors. The names given to tidal devices express this in the clearest way. Limpet, Oceanus, Pelamus, Sea Dog, Thor, wave dragon and oyster. Turning to the sea, place names exist in space. They evolve in speech over time. The wave the rock reef makes, bod. The rock reef that makes the wave, ba. Bod, we sink or swim, ba, by such distinctions, bod. Ba. Meaning is tidal. Speech steers names into new forms as ears confuse tongues in linguistically hybrid cultures. Jacobson gives the farm of airs from Orr, a pebble strand on Shetland. There's also an air on Kirkwell, 
which, uh, or which I imagine is the same meaning. Marwick gives the anchorage of rivers from Reba, Rifa, scratch, scrape, a groove in the rocks. This gyrating between sound and sense as we flow between dialects energizes one's language. Today, local dialect and the sea lore it embodies have not been adopted by the wave energy community, but they work in the same tides. Men, men and out of the mouth, which is men bay, men mouthful of sand and pebbles. Men, mouth of the river. And mother, men, saw on the child's Scots tongue saying, men, men. Bannermen, men found in names on Shetland sites such as Bannermen, the terror mouth, banner band or fetter, men mouth. Forgive my attempt at what we've decided to call a mid Pentland Firth accent. <laughs> Burra tethered by a sandy rib, puckering the lip, scorning the bod, soon's a mouth and Anna's the shoulders, murmuration, need food for men. Burra, the island of Burra, tethered by a sandy rib, puckering the lip, imitating the wave, imitating the form of the wave. Sound is a mouth, and ama, the Indian for mother, is the children's way of murmuration, is like grisly, grumpy way of calling for your mother. Needful for mother. Another Shetland name, score many, the mother sound. Score, hollow in the seabed, sound, men, mouth. <coughs> Soon's a scar marked in the sea bottom. The brimtoods flew in the mouth, foo sounds, foin, laumen, swinkling, beaten on the cord of the earth. Sound is a scar <coughs> marked in the sea bottom, also on the tongue. <coughs> the brim tide, the brimful tide, is flooding the mouth. Full with sounds, falling, uh, swinkling is uh, kind of glittering, uh, beating on the cord of the earth. Wave is breath, moon made ocean on the blank ocean, breath is wave. From out of the mouth we enter the stream as at Stroma, the tide stream isle, whose name foretells a harvest of power to come. Stroma, strummer, straumer, stormer, streamer, dormer, dimmer, dreamer. The strummer boys in the harbour, beating time under coy, hour and hour. The stream spirals of Stroma into a tidal whirlpool, for the sea has names. Swelky, swelky, swirly, swelchy from Svelga, cauldron, an origin myth for the cult of sea energy in the Pentland Firth. Salt, salt, turs, salt turls the blade, coils the soon swells the salt. Salt turls the blade, coils the soon swells the salt. As Swelky swirls out of the magical cairn of Grotti, Grinding all the salt in the sea, a foundation myth for when the firth is filled with turbines. For all energy is, is motion, which we can mark yourself, dipping a fin in the rass, plying your fingers in an S, swelking in an S, for there's power to release. Scatter yourself, flashing sparks, transferring the fluor into an adapter. Till the hail firth's electric. From the swirling firth and grinding cairn, like a turbine, to the ebbing sea racing between islands, a cairn is a stone hand mill, and the motion that the hand makes in it is like a, 
a memory and prediction of the motion of the turbine which will turbines which will one day fill the Pentland Firth. We come to the ebbing sea racing between islands at Evie from Effia, Backcurrent, Aben, Offing, and Einhallow, Effia Sund, Uben, Uben. The sound of the sea's motion churning over the underwater realm of the Finn folk. From Neolithic times, this strait had sacro political significance. The nine broths, cut mark stones, tombs, and barrows face the tide. They align with the roost from Rost, the tidal race. Ships rode the sound, their keels writing a line in the flood of glottal bays, hidden reefs, and spuming rhythms. In a power play performance, of force and surge, expressing the cult of energy. That's my interpretation of that tidal race and the performance of the ship sailing down it, a kind of symbolic ritual. Now, an archaeological bearing runs from this tidal cult of Edie, Einhallow and Midhow to the half-forgotten rational wind cult on Costa Head and on Costa Hill, site of the UK's first large-scale wind turbine, which you've seen already, designed by the pioneering windwright Edward William Golding, director of the Electronic Research Association. I'll skip a bit, I've been given two minutes. Golding began to survey the wind on islands and coastal regions. But he came to Orkney to do his crucial research. And that research was revealing that it showed the wind's stochastic complexity can be reduced to a continuum of needle and spindle, modulating a measure of weather. The white coated lab assistants calculated their sums, estimating the wind's sea assisted blast. They designed the tower made from a helicopter, adapting the metaphor of flight. The engineers strove to comprehend the wind's pitch of swirling distortion. This was the place that the wind was first understood in the pre-digital age. Times reduced this technology to archaeology. The shell of the hut, the remains of the bays, rusty, rusty pegs, twisted cables and metal stops. Golding's Bible, his book, remains still in print, but the understanding of national forces and natural, natural forces and how we harness them is still being passed down. He foresaw the horizon of fossil fuel and he looked beyond it, but his research was forced to the margins by big coal and oil. What remains is the hill Sorry, I went ahead. What remains is the hill, the site where our culture first understood the wind. But it's not being remembered in terms of archaeology. It doesn't have what we might call a name, and Golding hasn't been given his due fame. Now, I'm going to ask if I can go a minute over and just skip through a couple of last examples. I wanted to also pick out the hydro sites and their importance. The hydrocytes will endure because of their particular combination of architecture and landscape gardening. I call this a water garden. This is Dalhonsi. It's a name that celebrates technological innovation and culture. Hydrocytes were open to walkers, unlike Dunray or Grangemouth. In conclusion, if linguistic archaeology suggests ancient place names prophesy energy generation, and if energy landscapes are the metaphorical meeting grounds of abstract instrumental reason, with the irrational local force of wind and tide, then should we subject an archaeological ruin like Costa Head to processes of cultural and archaeological ruin, or this future ruin, forgive me, Neil, uh, Billy a crew, should we transform their names in acts of past, present and future 
memorialising. And finally, to consider how this might be done, the example of the English artist John Latham, who 40 years ago addressed a crisis of the shelvings of West Lothian. He adopted the methodology of the antiquarian imagination. These sites were commonly known as eyesores, and he simply renamed them, declaring them a Celtic goddess, Nedry women. Latham said that seen from the sky, the mounds revealed an earth mother cradling a triad, Nedry women, heart and limb. Now these things are amongst the largest man-made objects, and they are ugly. Each summer, however, blesses the slag with a blind renewal of green, as the slope is fringed with redemptive covering of rare alpines, club moss, melilot, wintergreen, willow, and orchid. Latham left no physical artwork apart from that name, but by invoking the ancient past and creating a deliberate confusion of time, he held open the space for preservation. Some things were later declared protected monuments and botanical SSI, thanks largely to his efforts. The symbolism of the earth goddess anticipated a time when nature would remediate the spoil and the landforms would be accepted culturally as heritage, natural and historical. We heard from Neil about the work of what I call Windwrights and Waverites, the leading figures in the new energy cult in the Orkneys, prophets and seers whose work, like Golding, is being opposed by hostile petroleum and the centralising forces of Westminster. In an archipelago where radical archaeological discoveries are being made in terms of ancient time, shifting our concept of what is marginal and what is central, should cultural imagination now be applied to other past and future ruins? Louise put forward the arguments for a socially cohesive view of wind energy, and what's interesting to me about Latham is that he seems to represent a figure of the eccentric visionary. At the time, a report in Scotland was always having uh, features saying how the bins were a terrible problem, that they were ugly and that they must be removed. And by mixing up time, Latham was able to anticipate a historical <coughs> era when the community would welcome them, when they would be able to hold that future uh, with a welcoming rust. Thank you all.